Right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to day two of our conference, our Cal OER conference 2024 on responsive pedagogy, extending the local innovation to advance global impact. I hope you are as pumped as I am for another great day of OER presentations. I want to thank the uh, organizing committee for all their hard work. Uh, we are so lucky to have representatives across the California education systems. They are amazing individuals who have really put a lot of time and done a great job with uh, the organizing of this program. We also want to say a huge thank you and give a round of applause woo, to all our sponsors who support uh, this event. Open Educational Resource Initiative at the Academic Senate for the California Community Colleges, the Michael. 20MM Foundation, the California State University Affordable Learning Solutions, and LibreTex all helped make this event possible. And last but not least, we want to thank all of you for being here today. Your registration fees and the contributions of our sponsors not only made this event possible, but enabled us to provide live captioning for the event. We are pleased to provide live cap uh, closed captioning for this event through our partnership with AI Media. All the sessions will have a live captionist available and users may enable closed captioning by toggling on the captions within the platform. We encourage you to get the word out and share what you're learning on social media platforms at Cal underscore OER and hashtag Cal OER 2024. You can also promote the Cal OER website at www.caloer.org. Uh, just a quick reminder of some Zoom basics. To ensure we get to hear the presenters effectively, please keep yourself muted. Uh, we strongly do encourage you, though, to participate in the chat with your fellow colleagues. Uh, if there is time for Q&A in any of our sessions, please just raise your hand and unmute when we call upon you. Um, or if you feel more comfortable, you can type your questions into the chat. All of our sessions are being recorded and will be available on the Zoom events platform, uh, and you'll have them available for up to six months after the event. You will be notified when all the recordings are live on the Zoom platform. All general sessions, the keynotes, and the system updates will be available on the Cal OER YouTube channel at tinyurl.com slash caloerarchive. One last quick reminder is don't forget that at one o'clock today, we have a systems update from all three higher education systems in California with representatives from the UC, CSU, and community college systems. So tune in for that. And now, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> <laughs> I have the pleasure of introducing our second keynote of this conference, Dr. Virginia Clinton LaSalle. I got the opportunity to meet Dr. Clinton LaSalle as a research fellow of the Open Education Group, which she leads as the primary researcher. Uh, she is also an associate professor in educational foundations and research at the University of North Dakota. Her research focuses on reading comprehension, open education, and effective learning. I've personally learned so much from reading all her scholarship in the area of open education, so I encourage you to do so if you haven't. Um, I'm excited to hear her talk on how Creative Commons licensing can promote equity and innovation. So let me welcome Dr. Clinton LaSalle uh, to the virtual stage to share her slides and <laughs> keynote today. So let me stop sharing oh. and let her take it over. Okay, well, thank you so much, Shelley, for that uh, especially warm welcome. I uh, actually, I uh, just was reading an article you wrote. I'm not sure if it was part of the fellowship or not on the journal uh, in the Journal of Scholarship of Teaching and Learning on Personalized OER. And uh, that'll be related to what I'm going to be talking about today about what are the opportunities that OER can provide for our students. Let me get the. Okay. And while she's setting up, remember, please, you can make use of the chat. We'd love to hear you. You can be interactive in the chats. And if you have questions, throw them in there. 
we'll be monitoring them. And if there's time for Q&A at the end, we'll bring some of those uh, forward. All right. All right. Well, um, I've already had a warm introduction from Shelley. And let me just get right into it. I, I will say before I get into the actual keynote, I want to give a shout out for our fellowship. Um, it, Thinking ahead, we're going to be call, doing a call for proposals in April 2025, but the purpose is to have mentorship and support for turning your ideas for research in open education into a published journal article. Uh, that support is both from what I can help you with as a mentor and what Jasmine Roberts Cruz who is a, a consultant on the project is able to help you with in terms of qualitative and DEI perspective expertise. And then also the collaboration community that the fellowship provides. Um, we also provide funding for open access fees, attending the open education conference and a stipend for successfully submitting an article for publication. So please keep this in mind, make a little note. If this is something you're interested in, let me know. We have more details on our website. So a bit of a roadmap of where we're gonna go in the next hour plus. There's a lot that can be said. So it took some picking and choosing on my part to think, okay, what are the best pieces? What are the most interesting components? that I can share with everyone today. And first, I'm just gonna review what Creative Commons licensing is. I know you had um, Gable speak with you yesterday and that's very much his area of expertise. That's, that's his knowledge base. Um, but I'm just gonna do a quick review for folks who maybe weren't able to be at his talk. I'm going to talk about the SCOPE framework, which is a new framework for open education research that I developed with Lindsay Gavouche and Jasmine Roberts Cruz. Um, the cost benefits, and then talking about editing materials, adapting materials, and student knowledge creation. So before we get started, I would love to learn a little bit about the folks in the audience today. So if you would please go on uh, Mentimeter, so menti.com and enter in this code. And you should see, oops, should see a prompt to enter in your position. So just to get a idea of who all is listening today. Okay, it is working, good. I was that moment of like, uh-oh, is this gonna? I know, I put in the, the code, but it's the five, five, four, it worked. Okay, okay. All right, we'll have a couple more, but I see most of you are instructors and faculty. So um, hopefully this talk will be informative as far as giving you some ideas, maybe some inspiration for your teaching practices and then for, for staff and administrators, um, you know, ways to support students and to have initiatives that can support open education. And uh, later on, I would really like to hear from the student perspective because we do, need to keep our focus on the students. That's that's the whole reason we're doing this. Right. As I'm talking about the various forms of open education, I, I want to share this quote from Rajiv Janjiani uh, that I really liked, which is as open as possible, as close as necessary. You know, open education isn't just one form, one tool, one resource, one pedagogy. There's no one size fits all approach. 
And a way to think about this is similar to how scholars in open science think about things like sharing their data and materials. Just because you can't have everything be open doesn't mean nothing should be open. There are certain situations where you may need to use a closed copyright. You may need to have student work stay private and within the course. Uh, and there are times when sh things like sharing your data and sharing your materials are just not appropriate. That doesn't mean we can never do it. And no one should ever feel like it's gotta be all or nothing. Yeah. I follow this uh, fitness influencer and do her workouts. Her name's Betty Rocker. And her big motto is all or something. So think of something you can do. It's not about doing it perfectly. It's about what pieces can you do? What steps can you take? All right. So as a review, what is Creative Commons licensing? And the licensing is what makes open education open education. So what differentiates it? Uh, as far as a defining attribute from other forms of progressive accessible pedagogy. And there's a great deal of variations in open, in open licensing with Creative Commons. Uh, generally it's Creative Commons licensing, but the minimum is that you give attribution. The maximum is you can have, you know, preventing editing or or um, commercialization, or. But importantly, the creator maintains rights, and in most forms of Creative Commons licensing, you are allowed to change your materials, and you are allowed to share your materials after you change them. This is very empowering. And I'm gonna go into that more later, but I want you to hold that thought to the side. Because oftentimes when I tell people about OER or they hear OER, they think it's just anything that's free and online is an OER. In fact, I had a colleague tell me, yeah, OER are great. Open educational resources are great until they start charging you. And I was very confused in terms of she was thinking about trial subscriptions to electronic resources. So with open educational resources, we have these five R's. Uh, generally speaking, the Creative Commons licensing allows for an instructor, a student to do all of those things with the material. Free materials are just that. <clears throat> They're free. If they have a restrictive copyright, you're not going to be able to retain, reuse, revise, remix, or redistribute. So we'll be talking specifically about how that Creative Commons licensing can be used as a tool for equity. I also want to talk a little bit about some of the shortcomings with an ebook that might be free but not open. So here's an ebook where it's a situation where you can uh, get free temporary access and then you have to pay for a subscription basically. And I'm gonna show more limitations, but the ones I wanna point out first are, you're not allowed to print. As you can look in the top right corner, there's a cross through the printer icon. Printing is not permitted for this textbook. Now some, most students nowadays read from an electronic device, but there are still students who like to print out their materials. They can do that with an OER. They can't usually do that with a commercial textbook, even if it's free. Another difference is that retention. Here is, is that same textbook and a screenshot is showing that the download is unavailable. That means you can't retain it. And as soon as your access period is up, it's going to disappear on you. This is different than an OER where you have that right to retain. You can download the information and then use it later. Moving on to the scope framework. This is a new framework that Lindsay Gavouche, Jasmine Roberts-Cruz and I developed. 
And the motivation for it was one that open education research had been criticized for being a theoretical. A lot of times we just, you know, we're looking at the cost issue and we're not thinking about what are the reasons for why we would expect OER to be good for students or open education in general. Also, there's a huge importance for social justice in open education. Most of what brought people in to the open education community is a concern to make lives better for their students, particularly their students who've been historically underserved in higher education. And we were thinking of how can we take this issue of lacking theory and connect it with this uh, need to explicitly state the importance of social justice. It always been something of an assumption or of course we care about that, but it needs to be explicit and it needs to be at the front. And then how can we have an organizational framework where these different components can be described and be conceptually overlapping with each other? And we took those pieces together and developed the SCOPE framework. Um, and it worked out very nicely that uh, SCOPE also, in my opinion, works, uh, makes sense from a visual or, you know, um, the actual process of scoping or looking into something aligns with what we wanted. We want this to be used as a way to investigate as you would with a microscope or explore like you would with the telescope what's going on in open education. Anyway, like I said, we wanted social justice at the front and center. Um, side note, um, shout out to Wordle, because thanks to Wordle, I was able to come up with the word scope when I was thinking about these different components and how to put them together in a meaningful acronym. So thanks, Wordle. Let's talk about social justice specific to open education. Sarah Lambert has some really nice work on this and I use it a lot and I highly recommend looking into her work and it's something that we talk about in the scope framework article. And it's about how open education can be thought of in terms of three components of social justice. Redistributive, redistributional justice, where you're providing access to resources to those who would typically encounter barriers. Uh, recognitive justice, where you're providing recognition and respect for cultural and gender differences, and represent representational justice. And this is hearing the voices and experiences of groups who've been historically underserved in society. I'm going to go through how that open licensing, that Creative Commons licensing, can be used as tools to support each type of these kinds of social justice. So first let's talk about the cost benefit of open educational resources. So open is more about more than saving students and institution money. But let's be realistic, money is very important. And it's particularly important to our students who have been historically underserved. Overall, it's the biggest barrier to getting a post-secondary education and finding ways to alleviate the financial burden of a college of education is in and of itself a worthy cause. And I'll be honest, cost is what brought me to open education. So here's a little story about uh, my adventures in life and college teaching. So my first time I taught a course um, as an independent instructor for a college credit course, I was teaching developmental psychology at a community college in Madison, Wisconsin. And tuition for my course was around $500. The textbooks, and they all cost this much, or at least $200. So this is a remarkable increase in the cost of taking my course just to have the book. 
No, there were certain workarounds. I mean, I could find, you know, I would recommend used copies. Um, I would, uh, if students found a pirated copy, I didn't say anything. Um, I would kept a copy on reserves. But I also noticed that, gosh, not only are these textbooks really expensive, but these textbook companies seem to have a lot of money to spend on publishing reps because they would come meet me outside of my classroom door and try to, you know, talk me into making my students buy their wares. Uh, later on, I taught intro to psychology at the University of North Dakota. So I had hundreds of students a semester. And during the time when we would have to announce or provide information to the bookstore about the um, textbook selection for the next semester, one week I had almost a dozen publishing reps show up. It was exhausting and annoying. And I knew talking to my students that the cost of course materials was a real barrier to success in my course. So when I first heard that I had the opportunity to learn about open educational resources, I took it. There was an open textbook initiative in my state. And part of that was we had a in-person workshop um, that uh, I went down with, with um, the person in charge of instructional design at my campus. And I heard from Tanya Spillavoy and David Ernst. Uh, Tanya does a lot of work with the, um, the compacts and <clears throat> at the time was very heavily invested specifically in the North Dakota open education initiatives. And David Ernst is in charge of the open textbook library at the University of Minnesota. So I heard from them you know, about the existing data. I heard from them about how much the cost of textbooks hurt students. And I got an invitation to review an open textbook, which I did. I received a stipend to do that. So that helped encourage me because, you know, at the time money was particularly important to me as an instructor with a heavy teaching load and small child. And uh, I was also given a stipend to adopt an open textbook. Um, and this also led to a research idea for an open textbook adoption. And, you know, back to money mattering at the time, I was pre-tenure faculty. Um, I'd moved into a tenure track role and I had just had my second child and I was unexpectedly raising my two small children by myself. So that stipend I got for adopting an open textbook was very valuable. And I was very focused in my initial work and seeing if there was a negative effect of OER. In other words, is this thing that's free going to cause a decrease in student learning? Is there gonna be harm? Because there's the whole idea of if it's free, it can't possibly be any good. So that was eight years ago, uh, what my family looked like then with my little Christmas newborn in the picture. And here we are more recently. And as you can see, my family structure has changed quite a bit. I, I got married and I gained two bonus children um, and my family is double the size where things are much more financially stable now. I'm tenure, I'm promoted. And my motivation for open education is still very strong, but just as my family structure changed and my life circumstances changed, I also had you know, changes to my uh, interests in open education and my perspective on how it could help students. So just a little bit more on why cost matters. This is the average cost of college textbooks. And back to that whole idea of, well, if it's free, is it not any good? Well, based on multiple meta-analyses, one of which I conducted, another that's more recent, both with you know over 100,000 students each, there was no benefit of a commercial textbook. So my conclusion is similar to one John Hilton made in a review a while back saying, all right, if there's no benefit in learning for a commercial textbook, then what are students getting from spending 
this thousands of dollars in their college education on textbooks. One solution that's often proposed is automatic textbook billing. I hate automatic textbook billing. I'm just going to start off with that positionality. And it's also referred to as inclusive access, day one access. And in this, students are, in my opinion, rather sneakily charged for their course materials bundled in with their tuition. They should be allowed to opt out, um, particularly if their instructors use an OER or just don't happen to have materials that are um, in included in the automatic textbook billing. But uh, basically students very rarely based on uh, reviews by of uh, policies by Redlington and they're, <coughs> Students generally don't know that they can opt out of that. You don't see any improvement in course outcomes, which there wasn't an improvement noted in the meta-analyses, but what my meta-analysis did find is reduction in withdrawal rate. That saves students a lot of money in the long term because students would find themselves in situations where they couldn't afford the textbook, so they have to drop a class. And this actually ends up costing them more in the long term because they don't have that short term funds available. It's one of the many examples of how it's expensive to be poor. Uh, there's really a lack of evidence this saves students any money. And what it really does is it benefits commercial textbook companies by locking in a for sure market. It's currently being reviewed for regulations by the Biden administration. I was very excited to see that. And I'm hoping that this is a practice that's going to be you know, rightly found to be inappropriate for students. Another cost issue is paying for homework. Uh, what we're finding is um, particularly after the 2020 shutdown in March, we're seeing that a large number of faculty, 72% um, 70, either require or recommend that students have an online homework system that almost always requires purchasing an access code to have temporary availability. So they can't retain these materials which by the way is another issue with automatic textbook billing. They only have access to the textbook for a temporary period. They don't get to keep the materials. Um, so say you're in first year chemistry, you go on to advanced chemistry, you might wanna be able to look back at your old textbook and you can't. But now students are not just needing the textbook to help them with the class, these online homework systems are usually part of their course grades. This is how they turn in their homework. Uh, Allison Kelly and I were interested in what students thought about these issues. And we found some rather alarming statistics. We found that a large number of students have to pay to do their homework. That means they have to, um, they indicated that they have had to pay for an access code to be able to do their homework. A substantial proportion avoid classes. <coughs> With these um, access code homework systems, almost a third say their grade was hurt. <coughs> we see dropouts and withdrawals because students are realizing that either their grade is hurt so much from not being able to afford to do the homework that losing those homework points is going to make them fail the class or they realize they're missing on the practice and learning opportunities with the homework so they need to withdraw and a non-trivial number have failed a course because they can't afford the access code that's required for the course These statistics are even more upsetting when you look at um, 
breaking down students based on their college generation status. So we know that first generation college students who don't have family members who have been through college have a harder time in college for a lot of reasons for that, you know, not having the the support systems for not having the finance, same amount of finances to not getting the hidden curriculum on how to navigate the campus. And we're seeing that being required to purchase these access codes is more harmful, disproportionately harmful for first generation students compared to continuing generation students, which in my opinion is quite alarming. So I've been talking a lot about money. Uh, I'm gonna switch to the costs of course materials outside of financial costs. <laughs> There's the idea of the digital device and internet access. A lot of times we rely on the assumption that students have these, um, but up to 10% of college students don't have reliable access to, to good internet at, in their homes. Um, and need to rely on using the internet or campus resources. So not being able to download materials is really frustrating for them. Uh, there's also the issue of time. So students engage in a lot of cost-saving behaviors if commercial materials are required, such as shopping at different stores, sh looking into sharing materials with a friend, or um, trying to find a used copy. And those all take time that is distracting from the real reasons that they're in college. There's the stress involved. Uh, students just knowing that they have those that extra financial burden, that can be very stressful. And uh, the cognitive load is another thing that I'm interested about. This is not unique to commercial or OER. But we need to think about like how difficult to understand are our resources. And when we design our resources, are we doing it to optimize attention and working memory and our other cognitive resources onto actually learning the content? Are students being overly distracted with trying to figure out the interface or understand how a diagram is supposed to relate to the text? And then uh, in the scope framework, Jasmine Robert Cruz uh, wrote in some really important points about how scholars who have been marginalized may be further marginalized um, in terms of social and political costs for their work in open education. And that that is an important thing to keep in mind as we do this work. So going back to the social justice <clears throat> framework by Lambert, we can see how OER truly helps with redistributional justice. In other words, simply by taking away the cost burden, we're engaging in red redistributional justice. Um, this can also lessen things in terms of time and effort and financial stress, uh, which also contribute to social justice. All right. Before I go into the next session, I have another Mentimeter. Uh, just, oops. Okay, sorry. Um, this one's kind of an open-ended one as I go into some of the, the issues with course materials and how they relate to diversity, equity, inclusion, and access. So I realize this is kind of a big question, but I would love to see if there's any examples that you have uh, for when you've had course materials, whether they're commercial or open, um, whether they're materials you've had when you were a student or that you've seen as an instructor or a librarian or instructional designer. And what are some of the issues in terms of diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility? So yes, lack of diversity in images, not mobile device. They don't see themselves. Yes, mostly white. 
the issue of outside the U.S. is something that I bring up a lot in my child development course, colonizing language. Lack of mention of marginalized person. Yes. Lack of diversity, lack of acknowledgement. I'm glad little material is offensive. I mean, that should be the, the bare minimum, but yes, so many are inaccessible. Captions won't turn on, difficult to use homework systems. That is something a lot of students brought up in our online homework system survey is that the systems were quote, janky, which I had to look up what janky meant. But these janky systems were a pain to use. Internet access technology, intentional neglect, outdated material, Western focus, colonizing focus, performative diversity. All right, thank you, these are excellent. And they very much all relate to the topic of editing materials for equity and inclusion. So as I mentioned before, the permissions of OER, that Creative Commons open licensing allows for editing. Now, uh, like was mentioned before, usually we don't see blatantly offensive comment in course materials, but unfortunately, it does exist. Um, and I'm going to show a few examples of course materials that engage in stereotyping um, and are clearly offensive. Uh, one is this is a from a nursing textbook. I actually had a nursing professor tell me about this a few years ago. This was published by Pearson in 2017, which was not that long ago. And this focus on diversity and culture, which is claiming or attempting to be a multicultural approach to nursing is riddled with horrible stereotypes and blatantly offensive. Uh, Pearson did remove this in the next edition, but it still somehow got initially published. Uh, so that's a commercial example. I don't want to say that OER are immune from, from offensive statements. Uh, so here's an example of exclusionary language. So a tribe has a very specific meaning to Native American and Indigenous cultures. It's not a word you throw around to just mean like a group that you're part of. So th the idea of consumer tribe or tribal marketing is very offensive. Uh, this particular example, I found personally offensive as somebody who was a single parent for years, where uh, this parent is described in a very stereotypical way, um, using generalizations made about single parents, where she's not involved with the school, that she doesn't do basic tasks that are involved with the school and she doesn't know how to connect with the teacher. So those are some pretty blatant examples, but we do know, as, as you all pointed out in the open-ended slides, there's a lack of diverse representation across content areas. And this is a real problem. Uh, there's problems with commercial textbook, but also OER. I don't want to say that OER are inherently better because the data show they are not. What makes OER better is you can change it. So here's some example of some edits that can be made for improving the inclusiveness and diversity of the materials. So you can actually go in in Adobe Acrobat or whatever function you have and change and delete things. Uh, use phrases like consumer fan club instead of tribe. Change the pronouns to be gender inclusive. Uh, change the examples to allow for more diverse representation. You can add images. Um, and the nice thing is because of those five R's, you can share back. You can share this with the community so they can also use your resources. These edits 
are a way to promote recognitive justice. So that that respect and recognition for cultural and gender differences to be able to have students have materials that uh, are improved in terms of the inclusion and diversity. So just to point out, there are some lingering questions about this whole idea of editing because uh, the idea that first comes to mind or is often done is that the instructor is doing the edit. And there's that question of who has that power to do that? Um, how to make this process of improving diversity more equitable because we don't want to just replace one power dynamic with another unhealthy, unhelpful, damaging power dynamic. So those are things to think about as we go through our materials and think about how to improve them. There's also adapting materials for accessibility, which was mentioned by some people in the open-ended slides is that materials are not always accessible for diverse learners. And one particularly important feature is that we need to have materials that can be read aloud. So this is absolutely essential to have things be screen reader and functional if a student has a vision impairment. That one's obvious, but what's less obvious is, is that being able to listen and read can, is really helpful for uh, disabilities, for, for people who have reading disabilities, uh, for struggling readers, and uh, there's some evidence that if you're reading in your non-native language, if you're a multilingual learner, then it can help you with vocabulary acquisition. It's also particularly useful to have the option to be able to listen to your materials without having them read aloud, uh, just because some students just have preferences to listen, or maybe that's the only way they can read their textbook is if they listen to it as they're doing other necessary tasks that they're responsible for. Going back to that commercial textbook, uh, it has a read aloud feature. However, it's a click and drag read aloud free feature. It's frustrating because you need to be able to see where to click in order to use this. Now this isn't, an... you muted yourself. I did, I'm sorry, I don't know how that happened. Uh, well, you all got to uh, simulate what it's like to not be able to hear. No, that was my fault. There, there, there were people talking, and I hit mute all. It wasn't supposed to do the the speaker, oh. the main speaker but it did. So that's my fault. <laughs> okay, okay. I'm just like, how did I do? That? Normally, that's a problem. When I, I usually make the mistake that I should have muted myself, and I forgot, and everyone gets to hear me um, reprimand my daughter in the background. <laughs> Anyway, uh, I was I was saying, and I'll just repeat what I said is um, that this is a screenshot of the textbook I showed before from a commercial textbook, and the read aloud feature is one where you need to click and drag, a, in order for it to be used. Uh, now, this is obviously a barrier for anybody who who can't see the book. If you're not able to see the book, you can't see where to click read aloud from here. And subsequently, you can't read your book. All right. I am going to, sorry. I'll show that for you. Okay. So what about OER? Hey, this goes back to OER aren't inherently better, but they can be made better. 
So reviews that have been done um, by librarians and scholars and scholarly librarians is that OER as a whole do not meet the accessibility guidelines that they should in order to be accessible across diverse learners. But just like with you know making changes to make them more inclusive and diverse, they can be edited. You can um, have more control over um, how that material is accessible for your students. And importantly, being able to download it means that you can download it and use um, the read aloud feature from Adobe or from Microsoft Word or from um, your internet browser. And those tend to be better in terms of accessibility. Um, not speaking from personal experience, just with what I've been told. So that allows for having to be accessible for people who have um, impaired vision, but also to have that ability to have the, to have reading while listening or audio assisted learn, uh, li reading uh, that seems to be very helpful for readers with dyslexia, readers who struggle with comprehension and uh, people who are reading in a language that isn't their native language. So, and then this accessibility is part of that redistributional justice. It's making sure that there's access to resources uh, to those who would typically encounter counter barriers. Oh, this is the particularly fun aspect, in my opinion, of open education. That's student knowledge creation. I, I, sh I saved the best for last. <laughs> Uh, and personally, I find this you know, one of the most exciting parts of open education. Um, and before we talk about open pedagogy, let's talk about how we got here. We wouldn't be talking about open pedagogy, which is pedagogy that is enabled through Creative Commons licensing, without the work of key theorists who work to break down white supremacist educational system. So this emancipatory approach to education that's embraced in open pedagogy is heavily represented in the works of Paul Frere, Bell Hooks, Iris Shore, Henry Giroux, and Peter McLaurin. And these emancipatory pedagogies focus on the notion that education should play a role in creating a just and democratic society. So this requires having a curriculum that's a dialogue with your students for their social interaction, collaboration, and there's ways to make real changes, um, both with the individual and society. So open pedagogy is different from traditional pedagogies, primarily due to what's called a disposable assignment. So disposable assignment was a term coined by David Wiley, the CEO of Lumen Learning, <laughs> where students do work, faculty grade work, students throw away the work, nobody ever looks at it again. It's disposed of. In contrast, a renewable assignment is one that continues to live on. So students do work, faculty grade work, there's value beyond the class and it is licensed so that other people can find it and use it. And these renewable assignments are key to open pedagogy. I'm gonna give some examples, and these are gonna range from assignments that um, are fairly straightforward and clear to, to introduce and implement in your classroom to you more complex. So Ashley Vettel is a uh, emeritus open education research fellow, and she found um, reviewing the photographs in her course textbooks that even the OER textbooks lacked diverse representation. White people were overrepresented and men were overrepresented. Uh, she teaches in Hawaii and has a very diverse student population. And she had her students take photographs related to the course content and prompted them to dig into how the course content is culturally relevant to that in these photographs. She had the students then 
put a Creative Commons licensing on them and share them and is working to update her textbook with the photographs. So what did students think about photo sharing? Well, based on the survey responses, it really motivated them to know that they were contributing to an open textbook. There were some concerns about public availability, but not overly concerned to the point where it was a, a barrier. Um, but that is something to keep in mind is you should not force students, in my opinion, to have their work be publicly available. Uh, they believe that their photos really added to the diversity and they generally thought that there was a lot of value in, in it. This kind of project contributes to what's called the sustainable OER ecosystem. In this, you have a system where OER are created, um, people are empowered to improve them, they make contributions, they receive attribution, and then they release them back, and then the cycle continues. Now, by having students delve into the cultural relevance of the material in their open pedagogy, this is an example of how open education can be used for representational justice. So students had the opportunity, and these students were generally uh, historically underserved groups, to, they had the opportunity to speak their voice and experiences, and they haven't had those voices and experiences heard as much in society as other groups. Another method is social annotation. This is something where students share notes on electric documents or files. Um, some journals actually allow for social annotation of the journals. Um, I found this out when I was looking up, ironically or coincidentally, an article that I'd published with an, with an emeritus fellow on social annotation. And what social annotation provides is students are sharing their comments. So this is an opportunity to flatten power structure because students speak can speak back to the text. They can argue against the ideas. They can also point out how their experiences are not the experiences spoken in the text. They can also share their personal examples um, not, and have those be heard by their peers. Um, this allows for a collaborative process that um, can really help with the community in the classroom. And uh, I looked at social annotation in my class and I asked them to think about how the social annotation mattered in terms of representational justice um, based on items such as those shown in the right. Um, I had them rate from one to five, uh, how much they agreed with those items. And you know, we found that students had moderately high opinions. So this is over midpoint, which from one to five would be a three. But it, you know, it's not as high as I would like it. So there's definitely some work I need to do in my classroom to think about how I can have my students feel more empowered in this process. Social annotation can also be used to edit OER. So Amy Nussbaum has a really nice article articulating the process used in her um, work on updating in an OER textbook. In fact, this fall, my big project for my class is going to have my child development students assist me in updating our OER using social annotation in a similar way. You can also have students create course projects and then put them on websites that can then be shared and reused in subsequent classes. So here's a really nice example from um, Heather Maselli uh, where she had her students in a general science course uh, created, edited, and curated websites on socially relevant topics. <laughs> so the students found topics related to social justice and their interests. And then here are a few examples. So we looked at how, uh, in another study, how students compared renewable assignments to traditional assignments in terms of representational justice and found that students did indeed experience higher levels of representational justice.
So another example is to have students write materials and create textbooks. Uh, this is, was done by my colleague, Allison Kelly, where she and another instructor collaborated with their students to specifically focus on scholars who are typically ignored in textbooks. So because of their gender or race. So I highly recommend looking at this and seeing what she and Brittany were able to develop with their students. So similar to the five R's in open education research, there are five R's to open pedagogy that we need to keep in mind as we're doing this, this work with him. There's a lot of potential, but there are some risks and such that we need to keep in mind. Uh, we need to respect our students as creators and be able to let them have rights for their intellectual property. We need to reciprocate. Um, don't have your students do something if you're not willing to do it. We need to be willing to take risks, but we also need to understand that students are putting themselves at risks with a public posting because the internet is forever. And REACH is realizing that learning is ongoing. So the idea with open pedagogy is there should be REACH beyond the immediate room or the, the class that they're in. I should go beyond the class and go beyond the semester. And resist against the idea of commercialization that information should be expensive and gate kept. Think about how you can use open education as a force for social justice. So I'll finish up there so we have some time for questions. Um, I will have a Mentimeter for the questions, but I did first wanna show this slide in case if there were any of the materials folks would like to access. Um, if you scan this, you will get a faculty guide to renewable assignments that I've put together um, explaining a variety of renewable assignments with links to resources, some examples, and if there is research evidence, there's research evidence on it. Great. And um, so, oh, somebody's monitoring the chat. So should we just have an open Q&A or should I use, I have a Mentimeter set up. Um, it's, it's up to you if you, would you prefer them into, or we can, I, there was, Wait, let's, we can just do an open Q and A and if okay. people are quiet, I'll, I'll show the Mentimeter because people might feel okay. more comfortable sharing. I see one in the chat, but there was one that came in earlier through the Q and A function on, so let me start with that one and then I'll go over to the Great. other one. So this was asking more, uh, a little bit about your thoughts about the paid homework systems. Uh, yeah, I have lots of thoughts. They, someone had asked. Are instructors using them because the system grades it for them? That yes. was one of the things they were interested in. Why, you know, the okay. word, I don't, I, know I don't have data so on that, but I would say yes. Okay. And not only does it grade them, it makes the assignments. Okay. So they're more of a- They don't have to write the assignments and they don't have to grade them. Okay. All right, let's see another, and another question. One thing I realized I forgot to mention, the reason why the shutdown in 2020 was is was so pivotal is because publishers had these um, systems temporarily free. So because there was such a drastic switch to virtual, a lot of instructors who ordinarily would have been like, yeah, the homework systems I or the homework sets I have and assignments are fine. Um, a lot of them out of genuine concern for their students and wanting to give them better online materials, they signed up for these. And then obviously they were only free that semester, <laughs> but they had put in the work of um, setting them up, learning the interface. And then all you need to do usually for the next course is just click copy course and you're done. So it's very tempting to continue. Makes sense. All right, another question that came in is for open pedagogy, one of the main issues I run into that, um, this is Daniel. One of the main issues that Daniel runs into when talking about implementing it is FERPA concerns. If yes. students are associated with materials for your course or given credit, mm -hmm. it shows that they were in that class. How do you right. recommend addressing this? I would recommend having them sign a waiver. Oh. Um, that it, you know, you can simply Google it 
and find out um, if if you have like a major course project such as this that their names are going to be on. Um, I had in my directions when I've had opportunities for my students to openly license their work, I had directions for the various types of licensing and, you know, said if you're willing to publicly share it, uh, you can have it with this license and be anonymous or this license and you'll have your name on it. Um, truth be told, I think because it was an opt-in policy and it was like another thing students had to do and they're just like, nope, I did the assignment, I'm happy. Um, uh, the the terms I've done that in recent times, uh, I get a handful of students who agreed to be anonymous, but generally speaking, they're a little nervous about having their name on something, which I get. Um, I've also had uh, students edit Wikipedia, which is an OER. A lot of people don't realize this, but Wikipedia is Creatively Commons licensed. It's openly licensed. Um, and then that the students have the protection of, you know, they have a username on Wikipedia that they can be anonymous for. But they also have the option to be identifiable so their contributions can be known. Thank you. Um, another one came in. It says, I love the idea of social annotation, but I'm concerned that I'll become dependent on a system that might go away. Any oh. thought on that? Um, well, perusal is handy. Uh, I will say I do like its features and tools for social annotation, but you can use something as simple as Google Docs. So for social annotation um, or possibly see if there's some way for students to have shared commenting through your open learning management system. So yes, the specific system that you choose or specific tool can go away, but the whole concept of social annotation going away is unlikely. There, there may not be as convenient of a tool or as useful as a tool, but there will be tools. And if you are in a position to encourage your institution to subscribe um, or to get institutional access to a tool, then it definitely helps that you've been using it and not just something you potentially would like to use. I, I like the idea of you framing it as a pedagogy that's kind of tool agnostic so that yes, you might lose a particular system, but you could still do that with whatever system that, that is free or available at that time. Okay. Yes. And you don't need to necessarily have social annotation for every document in your class. If you feel like that would be overwhelming or it would require too much redesign, the tool would go down, you know, even um, something I'm going to be doing this fall is having social annotation of my syllabus. So I can see where students are getting confused and also hopefully they'll read it better. <laughs> Great. Okay. I don't see any questions at this time. I'll give it a, a I'll do the, the famous, you know, waiting as a good instructor <gasps> some time. So time for everyone to have their thoughts. If nothing else comes in, um, we can wrap up a little, little early and give everyone a little break before the next session. And I hope uh, everyone's looked through and chosen and exciting from all the wonderful choices out there. Um, let's see. Oh, some people are mentioning they have used Google Docs as a comment feature in courses before. Um, oh, you okay, the QR question. code. Um, yes. I'm assuming the QR code for the... I can also put the direct link if someone can't get the, the tiny URL to work because I opened it. So let me put that in the chat too. Oh, okay. So yeah. there's the Google Doc link. Is there a different way instructors maybe will use a free resource that does not cost, pin the cost on students? Um, I mean, it, I'm not sure if this means like, does it have to be Creatively Commons licensed? I mean... Sometimes the materials that are best for your class are not going to be Creatively Commons licensed. This goes back to the as, as open as possible, as closed as necessary. I teach a program evaluation course, and a lot of really good materials out there are government documents. And those are not Creatively Commons licensed, but they're very helpful for my students. So, you know, I have them available to students, and then students create their own projects and their own ideas. But... Um, you know, I don't get to do, I don't get 
the flexibility that it would with a Creative Commons license. Does that mean, does that mean that, um, I'm not going to use a material that's free just because it's not open. No, if it's a good material, I'm going to use that. You know, your your first priority should be thinking about what's going to benefit the student and a free government document that is really clear and helpful. That's going to benefit my students. I see one um, more. As a side oh. note, I when I switched to an OER in my child development class, I did tell my students. Um, you know, the, this OER, it's free. You can download it. You can have it on your computer. I got it linked to Blackboard. So it's easy to find, easy to use. Um, but I'm like, I get that, you know, the graphic design is not the best. Um, and, uh, you know, so the pictures aren't as flashy and all of that. I was like, if you really want the pretty pictures and the glossy pages, I can tell you which commercial textbook to use that covers the same content for $200. And they all laugh. <laughs> like, nobody has yet to say, no, 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 I really want those pretty pictures for $200. There was a question, I think that's more related to just your opinion on what you're doing. They say, do the mm -hmm. students get graded for annotating the syllabus? Um, my students will. They'll get participation points. I have a very lenient grading system. So Parisel has a grading algorithm. I'm not a fan of it because it's it's a low stakes assignment. It's not that many points. And students are going to get out of it what they put into it. And I, I just know it's too many little quirks with the grading algorithm for me to feel comfortable assigning credit on it. That's me. Other people have different experiences with the algorithm. There's studies that show the consistency with instructor grading is usually pretty good. That's just my quirk. Um, I simply look through and see, you know, I'll tell my students you're required to post five annotations or six, you know, whatever. And that is what their grade is based on. Um, and I have been floored by the majority of the students most of the time doing really good work and I'm not gonna completely reconfigure my grading system out of a minority of students the minority of the time doing a huh that's nice <laughs> <laughs> but they seem to more spontaneously open up and share deep meaningful insights or ask questions on social annotation as opposed to discussion boards. Um, and then what I also do is um, I look through for questions and then I answer them and you can tag the student so they know that you're responding to their question. They get an email. Okay. Trying to see if there's anything else. There's a question about Lumen Learning. <laughs> Oh, that's a controversial. <laughs> yeah, it's a little more specific. Um, okay. I have great respect for David Wiley and the materials that Lumen Learning develops. Am I totally in agreement about having a for-profit system that students pay into, even if it's low cost? There's a bit of a, you know, ick there for me. Um but I know they chose the system because it's sustainable. It's one that they can, um, don't have to be dependent on grant funding and such to use. Do I have my students use Lumen Learning? No, I don't have my students pay anything because that's my priority or my ethos as an educator. Is it, I also think there is a very big difference between having your students pay $15, $20 for Lumen Learning when they get to keep their work too. That's another thing. These online homework systems disappear, uh, which I know is a responsible company compared to Pearson, which spends more time and money tracking down instructors and trying to sway them into purchase, making their students spend 
or temporary access to their systems. Those two things are very different. Okay, I don't see any more questions coming in and we're getting right about at time. Uh, so I wanna thank you, Dr. Oh, for that. You're Fabulous welcome, thank you so much for inviting me. <laughs> And I want to remind everyone, we've got a lot of sessions going on today, so we look forward to seeing you at other ones. You all have time back. Uh, the next session should be starting at 11, I believe. Yes, yeah. at 11 o'clock. So we hope to yeah. see you again on Zoom. Yeah. And if you have any questions or anything, if you're looking for those materials, I'm really easy to Google. There are not many Virginia Clinton Los Salos out there. And uh, my materials are all on my faculty page at UND.